Hey folks, on this episode of TWIP Talks, I sit down with Zeev Farberman. He's the co-founder of a company called Light Tricks. That's Light Tricks with one T dot com. And uh, they create an app called Enlight. You can find this app at enlightapp.com. So in this conversation, we talk about this amazing new photo processing app that they created, as well as some, some forward-looking thoughts on computational photography as it is applied to mobile devices and mirrorless cameras of the future. So check out this interview. All right, folks, I'm here sitting with Mr. Zeev Farbman. He's the uh, co-founder and otherwise dude in charge at a company called Light Tricks. It's L-I-G-H-T-R-I-C-K-S, one T, so Light Tricks. And uh, they make a cool app that we've talked about on This Week in Photo before called Enlighten. So the, the context of how we talked about it initially was was because we were talking about Snapseed, which is a competitor to Lightrix, and then some some of the TWIP army rose up and said, dude, you got to go check out Lightrix. So I did, or go check out Enlighten. So I did and was blown away. So hence this interview, uh, I'm talking with Zeev about it. Uh, and I want to get, basically, before we dive into just sort of all the nuts and bolts of this application and what it does for photographers, Zeev, I want to first welcome you to the show. Welcome to This Week in Photo. Thanks for inviting me, Frederick. Hey, man, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, but I want to I want to dive into the history a little bit of of and the why create this app. So you create a company. This I want to is this first of all is, is Enlighten uh, a funded kind of initiative or is it bootstrapped or how how are things going there? Yes, yeah, so, so far we are a completely bootstrapped operation. I mean, initially all the tech founders of Lightrix were PhD students in the computer science department of the, of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel, and the, most of our research was on border between image processing and computer graphics. So, you know, Yaron was doing pre-computed radiant transfer, which is mostly rendering, and Amit was solving some deep blurring and video stabilization problems. But uh, more or less all of us were, you know, inside this field that these days is called computational photography and you know at some point we started to look at the, the mobile devices and what we saw was pretty exciting right so it started with the prototyping project so for example your own did this augmented reality thing where you could look through the iPhone's uh, camera and see how for example a poster from allposters.com will appear on uh, you know on your wall in your home right, right. so m mobile became pretty exciting thing because you had the camera and the computational device and the bun bunch of sensors uh, together so you know it, it looked pretty exciting and at some point we actually started also to look what's going on with the image processing software on mobile and Snapseed was indeed you know this watershed point where, where we realized that you really can do a lot of cool stuff on mobile, but you know, from one side we were like super impressed with Snapseed. On the other side, we thought that we really can come up with the software the, which is even more capable. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't start with the Enlight immediately. I mean, we were you know just uh, four guys programming in the garage. So we created an app called Facetune, which mm -hmm. is basically a, a portrait editing application. And, you know, Facetune became a super successful, it reached the number one paid app rank in more than 100 countries. And, you know, from profits, uh, from Facetune's profits, we started to expand our team, our crew, and right now we already have 25 employees and we cont continue hiring. So, a year and a half ago, we started to work on the infrastructure for Enlight, and, you know, it took us a while, but... Uh, we are finally here with the, you know, I believe it's quite large and. Uh, That's amazing. I mean, that the whole thing is amazing. The whole, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I, you think back to how young the iOS is and just this kind of mobile computing is. Just a few short years ago, we were all using dumb phones and now we have apps like Enlighten that are doing Photoshop-esque type computational photography 
in the palm of our hand. It's just a few years ago. And it's just, it's yep. amazing, right? Yep. I mean, four years ago, the probably the most advanced thing that you could, can do, could, could do on mobile is probably like blend two images together. So you saw app, apps like Color Splash, for example, where you could like paint with black and white and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was cute and nice. I mean, you could do all, all kinds of creative stuff with blending two images, but you simply didn't have enough computational power and, you know, enough memory in order to run more advanced stuff. And it indeed changed super rapidly, right? I mean, uh, these days when we're thinking about next iteration of our uh, rendering pipeline, I mean, the kind of features that we're thinking about and trying to prototype and implement are direct, directly, you know, taken from the state-of-the-art academic papers, right? And yeah. basically, you know, these days you can take a SIGGRAPH level stuff and try to implement it inside your mobile pipeline, which is quite amazing. Indeed. That's exciting. That is really exciting. So, okay, so that, that's a little bit of the history. So uh, let's talk about the, the marketplace itself. And then I want to, I know people that are watching and listening to this want us to talk about the app. We're going to do that. But I want to get a little bit of foundation in there first. Um, and the first obvious question is, if you look at the app store, especially in the category of photography apps, it's a crowded field. I mean, you know, I think about a year or so, maybe more ago, I gave up on trying to go in there and find the coolest app because there's so many cool apps in there. You know, you spend all your time trying to find an app and never using them. So when you, you I know you guys came up with Facetune first and then that evolved into Enlighten. But when you look at the App Store, why did you, why create another app? And how did you think that you could do it better than the Camera Pluses and the Snapseeds and, you know, all those guys? Yeah, so I mean, if you look it, it, at the photo and video category, like uh, from a high level, it looks like there is a lot of uh, noise and activity there. But yeah. you know, if you're actually looking at the top ranked apps in this category, in the photo and video, in top paid apps and you know top grossing apps and top free apps, actually these apps are not changing that much over time, right? Mm -hmm. So. In free apps, you have like Visco, for example, right now, and you know other free editors. And uh, in paid apps, you have Facetune and Light, and it, it's not that crowded. I mean, there are like a bunch of the top competitors, top you know contenders to the crown, but uh, it, it's a you know decent and feasible market. I you know don't have anything to complain about. I think yeah, right now you know Light is a top paid app in the overall ranks of the, you know, US app store. So yeah, I mean, it, when, when it's crowded, and from my, you know, granted, I'm just a, you know, a, a lay person when it comes to app development and, and marketing and sales for this type of product. But when I look at it, I think of it from a, a pure, almost Darwinian standpoint, right? It's survival of the fittest and the great apps will rise to the top and the not so great apps won't, right? So it puts the it puts the onus and the responsibility on you as a developer to make something outstanding that is going to stand out from the pack, right? Yeah. I think, you know, App Store really creates a fair marketplace where the barrier of entrance is super low. Mm -hmm. You don't need to think, you know, too much about your distribution channel because that's basically what App Store gives you. You don't have to think too much about your marketing channel because, you know, these days you have mobile app installs in Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. So basically it creates a really fair market where, uh, you know, best ideas, best software can really win. And I think, you know, in such conditions, a customer is definitely a winner at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it looks like there's... I mean, I've seen sites pop up that are that that take on the task of curating for users so that you don't have to go into that, you know, the herd of apps out there to find the one enlightened app in there that, you know, that's or in light app that's in there that's going to, you know, blow your knock your socks off. They do it for you and say, OK, here are the best of the best. So that's good and bad because now you have a gatekeeper who has a subjective opinion on apps and may skip the one that you thought that might have been great for you. Right. Yep. Um, so let's move on. So I want to talk about the app itself. So it's called Enlight. I'm looking at the site now, enlightapp.com, if users want to go check that out. Enlightapp.com is where it is. And you guys you guys have a great video. It's a very modern design page. Um, so let's talk about the app itself. What When you put together the app, 
you know, you guys are sitting at the whiteboard designing, okay, this is going to be the app of the future. What was going through your head as to how you wanted users to interface with this particular piece of software? Yeah, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's a great question. And, you know, keep in mind that the process of uh, designing even the high-level concept of user interaction in, in such app, you know, basically take, take months, right? It's mm -hmm. not like from today to tomorrow, but basically it starts with kind of rough concept of what kind of capabilities you want to give your user, right? So, for example, for us, local editing was always super important, right? I mean, uh, that's one of the most, that's actually one of the powerful tools that uh, I like in Snapseed, right? Where you can create these uh, masks with the, their, like, uh, you know, point interface. So, we wanted to have masks and everywhere. So that's one in the beginning, one of the constraints or our pipeline, right? We wanted to have kind of infinite number of masks in each feature. And then we also, you know, wanted to implement uh, a lot of, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of functionality that didn't exist on mobile so far. So for example, in the light, you have these local co contrast adjustments that uh, you don't see them that much on mobile beca because they're computationally expensive and uh, so it basically starts with you know a bunch of different stuff that you want to give the user yeah. but uh, and you, do, you, you don't find in the other places and then you start uh, to try to think about what's the you know what's the right modularity for all this feature right I mean uh, you can always adopt this, you know, desktop approach where you just, you know, take a million of different sliders and just put it, put them somewhere like Lightroom does. Mm -hmm. But we experimented with these approaches and they didn't work that well on mobile. I mean, you know, your screen uh, real estate is really limited and the nature of interaction is different. So we spent a lot of time understanding how we package these degrees of freedom into these modular features that will, you know, from one perspective will be powerful enough, from another perspective won't be too overwhelming to the beginner user, right? Yep. And, you know, after a lot of thought, we came up with this concept of, uh, you know, there, every modular feature has this wor workflow of presets, tools, and masks. Mm -hmm. So if you're, for example, go to any feature in the light, let's, let's say just, right? In the beginning, you're seeing Instagram-like presets, which are super easy to use to every user. And if you're a user that's a little bit more advanced, then you can go to this tools level where you can, you know, control every degree of freedom, right? So in such features like Adjust, you have like uh, almost 30 different degrees of freedom packed inside one feature. Wow. And then if you're even more advanced, you're going to this uh, mask tab, which basically gives you the local editing, and of course, you know, you can save your own presets and stuff like that. So at some point we understood that this is really the workflow that we want to give our users, right? We started with, you know, a bunch of prototypes. I think the first feature was actually black and white with the, you know, this flow of presets, tools, and masks. And, you know, we run a lot of usability experiments. Again, these things, the refinement of the interaction takes a lot of time. Yeah. But, you know, at some point we realized that it felt like a kind of a sweet spot uh, on how you package the features. Yeah. And we decided that's how it's going to work across the app in, or in order to create, you know, a consistency. So if, you, you, if a user, for example, learns and masters one feature, he he will have an easier, easier time to understand other features. So it was kind of a constraint on the features. And, you know, then we started to try and, you know, think how we package different image processing algorithms and capabilities inside, the, inside these, you know, modular features. So that, that basically was the flow. You start with some kind of high-level capabilities that you want to give to the user, and then you understand the workflow, of these modular features, and then you, you know, finalize the capabilities for. I love that. Yeah, presets, tools, and masks. Yeah, and just just by listening to you say that, kind of, 
you know, I kind of understood how the app worked, you know, and kudos to you guys for the, the, the tutorials and the built in explanations that are inside the app. I think that was, I don't think I've seen that before. So congratulations on that. I really like that. Um, but now I understand. I understand you start with a tool and you have a presets, which, which are essentially starting points for your edit. And then you can go in and fine tune that edit later, right? Or start with neutral and jump directly into tools and, and add your whatever changes and edits that you want to the, uh, to the photo at that point. Yep, exactly. Really, really cool. Okay, I'm going to run down my list here. So, um, well, so what, and we're going to, you know, I'll do some, some recording and some screen capture, you know, and show how the app works to, to, so folks can kind of see it as we walk through this stuff. But jumping out of the, the app a little bit and talking about this computational photography trend that you brought up, you know, I know Adobe, it, that's what they do, right? Computational photography. But I wonder, one of the questions I have is, at what point in your mind, sitting kind of in the middle of all this, does mobile, you know, replace the necessity to have a laptop computer? Like, for example, Apple is rumored to be coming out with a larger iPad, right? If that larger, more powerful iPad comes out and I have a, a version of Enlight that runs on that, do I even ever need to go to to Lightroom or Photoshop at that point for you know most of my needs? What what's your positioning on that? Yeah, so I mean it really depends on on your needs. I mean at this point I don't really feel that you know Adobe should be threatened, right? I mean it's <laughs> really, I mean some things are really hard to do on mobile even uh, with like big touch devices. But I think for you know for many purposes it it will be really pl plausible to remove the laptop from the equation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, we're still not there, right? I mean, one of the big things, example, uh, for example, for me, that need to happen in order that, you know, this flow will feel completely natural is a better transfer of the files from your camera to your, uh, say, tablet, right? right. That's, that's the reason I, you know, asked you to introduce us to iFi guys. I mm -hmm. mean, then... These things are going to be one, a big focus for us, right? I mean, we really want to have this seamless flow where you are taking your your raw file, your you know your pixels, and you know transfer them wirelessly and uh, to your device, and then you can start edit them, arrange it, arrange it into albums, put it in web, and you know in anywhere you want. And you know we're not exactly there, but I believe that this is something that will start happen. Actually, in the, in, in the upcoming year, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that, that far away. I mean, we're already working on the raw pipeline. And, you know, I, I know about a couple of other crews that are also pushing in this direction. So that's not far away. And, you know, f I mean, Photoshop for designers isn't going to be replaced by any mobile software anytime soon. Yeah. But Lightroom... I definitely see how it can be, you know, removed from the equation for at least, you know, a, a significant uh, segment of the market, right? Yeah, and yeah. You know, there, there are a bunch of things that really unique to mobile that you can't do on the desktop, right? So you, you mentioned computational photography. So, you know, the, the combination of the camera and the sensor of the compu and the computational device gives you a bunch of really unique opportunities on, on mobile, right? So... Take, for example, the, you know, the fact that you have a gyro accelerometer and a magnetometer, right? And you have the, all this IMU data from the device. So one of the things that you can try to do with that is correct blur and, you know, camera shake, right? Because mm -hmm. basically the device can capture the movement of your hand during the exposure. And then this, this data is going to be super valuable when you are going to try to correct the blur. I mean, right now, it, it doesn't work that well because the amount of samples that you, you can get from the gyro and accelerometers on the mobile is, uh, I mean, it's still not enough in order to get something meaningful, yeah. even on uh, long exposures. But I think it's something that is going to change in the next year or two. And then out of the sudden you will have advantages on mobile that you didn't have on the desktop and it's, it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's interesting. You know, from my, my standpoint as a user, the, 
I think the, for me, the, the key thing that's missing is storage. And that's a hardware thing, right? So, you know, if I have a, you know, my iPad mini here with 64 gigs or 128 gigs in there, that's great for most things that I want to do until I start trying to manage <laughs> large libraries yeah. of raw files. So if Apple or, you know, Android or Samsung, whoever, you know, creates a mobile device, and I know these are out there already, but on the iOS side, if there's a mobile device where I can plug in an external Thunderbolt drive and have my media there and then manage it on the, you know, you have the UI on the device to actually see that data, whether it's raw, JPEG or whatever, then that kind of shifts things a little bit because now I'm not clogging up my device with all my, all my data from today's shoot. Is that, do you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely agree, but I also think that, you know, cloud storage is going to play a big part of that. Yeah. I mean, I think we're really only at the beginning of the storage wars, right? You yeah. really can imagine that all the big players, you know, Dropbox, Box, Amazon, Microsoft, and of course, Google and Apple are going to try to, you know, buy it from this space and, you know, it will drive the prices down. You know, these days already at Flickr, for example, you can have, you know, huge amount of uh, space for cheap. And I believe, you know, Amazon will have new initiatives soon and stuff like that. So I think, of course, you know, the, the vi wireless speeds are going to be a little bit faster in order to allow us, you know, seamless uh, raw workflow, but we will get there. I mean, yeah. that's... Yeah. That's what's exciting about this whole space is things are, you can see that progress is here. We're not just standing in one spot folks like you and you know apple everyone is is innovating and creating things that we can't even think about we can't even conceive of will be available to us in the, in the next couple of years so yeah it's exciting so with that forward looking when you you know there's we on the show we talk about mirrorless cameras a fair amount versus dslrs and you know that trajectory how things are moving there the other side of that coin is mobile right so there's kind of the the three image capture modes that photographers use is there you know it could be the dslr or a mirrorless camera and or a mirrorless camera and then they're mobile for casual type photography but with with this computational photography and all the power that's in the mobile devices and mobile devices getting better and better and more capable do you see a future where that middle ground mirrorless camera may go away and be replaced by a mobile you know the mobile phone will be able to do everything we need or will we see technologies like these computational algorithms that we're seeing for for high end image processing migrate their way into a mirrorless camera of the future, you know, where now I can run in light on my camera and and have it real time blur the background with computational uh, yeah. photography algorithms. What do you think? Yeah, okay, so, you know, first of all, I am not a hardware guy, right? So yeah. everything that I'm telling you take with a grain of salt, right? Sure, sure, sure. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really think that... Um, we're going to, I mean, there, there are some basic, uh, you know, laws of physics that prevent from like tiny sensor with the <laughs> crappy optics, you know, to perform right. as well as the, you know, big sensor with the, with a nice optics. So, yep. I mean, th that said, I think, you know, for the point and click cameras are going to disappear, right? Point and shoot cameras. I mean, I don't think that there's a, a whole lot of place for them. Mobile cameras w will be enough. A, in terms of mirrorless cameras, I mean, they became increasingly better these days, right? Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, using Sony Alpha 7 and, you know, it, it's a credible camera, right? It's small. You, you can put uh, basically any optics you want on top of that. So I, I don't think that mirrorless will disappear anytime soon, but I do believe that the workflow will improve, right? I mean, right now it's still a pain to to work only with your, say, mirrorless camera, DS slash DSLR and, uh, and tablet, but th th that's going to improve. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in terms of how the um, camera vendors, I don't know, Conan and, uh, Canon and Nikon will react to the changes in this market, I mean, you really can imagine that they also will try to integrate new kind of sensors in their cameras, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that hard to imagine that if indeed these these deblurring techniques will improve, that uh, you know, Canon or Nikon or Sony or whoever will 
introduce new sensors in the camera that will basically under the hood perform the same algorithms. And so, you know, it, it can go both directions. But, you know, my current bet will be that uh, smartphone cameras will be enough for, uh, let's call the general population and, you know, people who will want a little bit more from their images will always want, I don't know, mirrorless or DSLR, but, you know, something with the better optics because, you know, frankly, if you're looking at the quality of the images of the mid-range DSLR camera with the reasonable optics and the, the best, uh, you know, smartphone camera, the difference is still huge, right? It I is, mean, it's, it is, it's yeah. not even in the ballpark, right? So I, I think there is place for... Yeah, no, but like I say on the show, I say on the show a lot. Photographers tend to think in in ors instead of ands, right? So there's there's <laughs> you can have this and that and use things as as appropriate. So a little bit before we close this off, a little bit uh, forward looking. You know, um, if we do, you see as a developer and someone who's exponentially smarter than I am with this kind of stuff. You know, do you see a future where we might offload, not offload, or we might do pre-processing of our images in the phone? So let me let me set it up. So here's a use case, a future use case. Future Frederick has his iPhone 10 or whatever, and I take a photo of a scene, and I know for every every, you know, my personal look is you know, I oversaturate a little bit, I throw a little bit of a, a vignette on it, and let's say that I, you know, I blur out the background just a hair, and I, you know, maybe make the reds pop out. My signature is is highly oversaturated, unrealistic reds. That's what I do. I do that to every single photo. I may crop differently, I may do different things differently, but I do that to every single photo. A, would it be possible in post-production to save that stack as a workflow that I apply to photos that I take later so that I don't have to redo it every single time? That's A. B, when, and when I say pre-processing, is there a future where I can look through my camera, my phone, and see all those changes? I'm looking through the Frederick filter. I see all those changes, the blur, the vignetting, everything real time, even the color pop is mapped and done correctly and when i take the picture i'm 90 percent there in my post processing what do you think is that am i dreaming or is that possible not at all i mean actually i, th I think we're almost there right i mean some stuff for example like blurring is uh, somewhat computationally expensive so some of the things you need to run offline right offline right now but we're almost there. I mean, most of these basic image editing operations you will be able to run in real time on basically the video feed that your camera gives you and, you know, to show really great preview of how it's going to look with your, uh, you know, signature filter look or whatever. I mean, you, you can actually, you know, Im imagine even a little bit more, right? We have even more sensors than I try with the watch, for example, right? So the watch will track at some point, maybe your mood, right? Because it can track uh, your posts and stuff <laughs> like that. So, it ba I mean, you, you basically can imagine an algorithm that will apply a different look according to your mood and possibly even the environment, right? For example, if you're, I don't know, like, like moody low light conditions and your smartphone detects that, right? Because you also have a microphone and a bunch of other sensors. So, you understand that you're this... I don't know, like ambient environment, yeah. and in these kinds of environments, you tend to go for a different look. You definitely can think about something that will also be dependent on your mood and on the scene ambience, right? I so I, I, I definitely think that this is something that people are really going to explore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or if it, if you're. You could take it a level further if your your the cloud or your phone or whatever knows that it's your kid's birthday that day, and it detects children in the photo. It may preset itself to get ready for the perfect birthday photos and use image recognition to make sure every photo with that kid in it is focused on that kid. <laughs> exactly. I I, I, def, I I mean it's really not a science fiction these days. I think you know a lot of. People these days are thinking about these personal assistants that will try to understand your daily life and your daily life and will 
try, you know, pop up some messages and hints and will uh, direct you to some stuff. I mean, there is no reason why these things will be disconnected from your camera and will, you know, work together in order to create the perfect image together with you. I mean, it, it, it sounds really reasonable. I don't think it's science fiction. It's something that will probably start to happen in, you know, two, three years from now. And we're, and we're yeah, we're just getting started. Just imagine what will be in five to ten years from now. Things will be a little bit crazy. So here's the last question, my final question about the app itself. Um, I know you guys have a, a way of doing sort of layer, layered effects in there. Do you have any... And I know, you know, you're a startup software company. You can't really talk about unreleased features. Um, but when we look forward, the holy grail, it seems like, for image editing applications is to be able to do layers. Like right now, you guys are kind of doing adjustment layers, but to do physical layers of pixels within the document itself. Do you, what do you think? Is that, is that something that's needed on mobile? Is that a trajectory that we can expect? Yeah, definitely. I mean... Um we definitely want at some point to have at least an infinite amount of adjustment layers, mm -hmm. right? So, um, I mean, it actually depends on the content of the layers. So, for example, if you have like a pure bitmaps, it starts in each layer, uh, then it starts to be an issue of, uh, of memory, right? I mean, memory on mobile is still an issue, so it's hard to create a system with the, an infinite number of layers. So right now we constrained in our Mixel uh, tool to two layers. But uh, I mean, if the content of your layers are adjustments that you are doing to your image and not, you know, some kind of stuff that you are bringing from elsewhere, it's not really that hard to tweak our pipeline and get to the point that where you have basically any number of layers that you want and. I do think that it's, you know, something that uh, is really useful on the mobile, you know, m m kind of my favorite workflow is always like, you know, to, to change the saturation in one region, to change the brightness in other region and, you know, do a bunch of these edits and it will be really helpful if all these different edits slash layers will be live so I can go back and tweak the parameters of each layer and it, it's definitely going to happen, right? I love it. I love it. Okay, here here's a, a free idea for you. So we were talking about those recipes, you know, the real time recipes and post production recipes. Yep. What if you created a marketplace where famous photographers could sell their recipes? You know, <laughs> that would be cool. So when you look through your phone, you you are you know seeing through the eyes of Joe McNally or somebody like that. That would be that'd be crazy. It's super cool. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, please don't patent this idea. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've, I'm patenting it, patenting it now. It is now yours. <laughs> I give it to you to use. Okay, last question here. Um, what's next? You know, what's what's next? Can we look forward to? And I want to, while I have you in the chair here, I want to put in my request for what I need next. Mm -hmm. I would like a iPad version of the app. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> That's what I yeah. want next. Okay, of course. So, I mean, we're really sorry that we weren't able to release the, you know, universal app uh, on day one, but, you know, obviously iPad is the biggest focus for us right now, and the iPad version will be out uh, at some point in the beginning or in mid-July, and, of course, it's going to be a free update to all of, all of the existing users, so it's going to be a universal app starting from the mid-July, and, uh, you know, Together with the iPad version, we will add a bunch of improvements. So you will have a heal tool and patch tool and, you know, all these things that will allow you to remove the imperfections from the images. And uh, another, but I mean, from now on, a big focus is going to be on the workflow. Mm -hmm. So we are going to improve and the file, you know, photos and album management in and light. So, you know, right now you can delete existing sessions and stuff like that. But... Uh, in the next version, we will add the ability to, you know, to delete files inside the app, to create new albums inside the app and stuff like that. Uh, also, in the next version, you will have the ability to export to lossless, lossless format with metadata. So basically, T format. Right now, you only have PNG and the different JPEG presets. And, uh, you know, in the end of the day, there are a lot of things that we still need to do in order to create a kind of a seamless and nice experience. I mean, right now, for example, if you have like a really huge collection of on your iPhone, 
let's say more than 100,000 images and you know some users have that yeah uh, the start of time of the application is uh, it takes a couple of seconds even on the new devices which uh, obviously is not so good so there are a bunch of improvements in the pipeline and in the image cache database which we still need to do so you know we have like a, a road map for the next year which is already like uh, choked with the <laughs> different features but uh, Obviously, iPad is uh, the first on our list and is going to be released soon. So that is great. Well, well, Ziv, congratulations on the app and your successes and building this giant company. It's twenty. How many people are you employing right now? Twenty-five. Twenty-five people that you're responsible for. That's <laughs> that's that's awesome. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll definitely. You know, I want to definitely direct the, the TWIB listeners to go and check out enlightapp.com. That's the site where you can get a walkthrough of the app. And, you know, obviously just go download it. And what, what's the price of the app right now, Zeev? So right now there is a special promotion with Apple and the price was reduced to $1. But, uh, I mean, the starting price was like $4 and it always fluctuates. We're still trying to find what's the you know, best price points. So yeah, an yeah, that's good. For us. It's a no-brainer at one dollar. I mean, I think it's a no-brainer at five, four dollars, five dollars. But one dollar, come on, this is you're buying Photoshop level post processing in the palm of your hand for a buck. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, this the whole market system that Apple built just uh, it, it never ceases to amaze me at the the economies of scale that you see from. From two applications, you're able to build a company that supports 25 people from yep. from two apps. That this wasn't possible just a few years ago. So, well, I mean, I, I think a dollar price point is not really sustainable for the you know for the project of such complexity. But uh, these kind of promotions are help to you know boost your ranks from time to time. So that's something that we you know we're doing together with Apple. But yeah, even five dollars, it's not you know. Exactly the desktop level uh, pricing le levels that we are uh, familiar with. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Ziv, I'll let you get on with your evening. Thank you for staying at work late. I know it's it's. What what time is it there right now, and where are you? So it's uh, well almost eight in Jerusalem. And almost eight o'clock p.m. on a Wednesday, or it's Thursday there, right? Is it Thursday? No, it's Wednesday. It's still Wednesday. Okay, okay. Yeah, this this whole circular <laughs> globe thing gets me. <laughs> All right, Zeev, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me, Frederick. You're welcome. All right, that's it for that interview. What a great discussion on computational photography and the future of where things might go for those of us that take images with our mobile devices. All right, be sure to check out Zeev's site over at enlightapp.com. Download the app and play with it and tell us what you think about it in the comments. All right, have a good one. <laughs>